Can you think of a time when someone's asked you a really, really good question? When's the last time that happened? Or even maybe a question when they're really good, they kind of stop you in the tracks. Do you guys, you guys know what I'm talking about? Do you, do you have those people in your life? Maybe you are that person that asks the really good questions. I'm, I'm married to a therapist, so I just feel like I just get the benefit from that. I get asked really good questions all the time. It's like, how, how did that make you feel? Tell me more about that. I'm like, ah, you know, but it, it, it was kind of questions they draw out some meaning. And, and if you are that person, I'm jealous of you because I'm more of a talker and I'm trying to really learn how to listen and, and ask engaging questions. And, and Kayla's rubbing off on me in that way. But, but if you have that skill, if that's your, 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 your mode of operation, if that's you, man, like you, it's a gift. Like it really is a gift because people who ask really good questions, I feel like when people ask me a question, I feel known, I feel loved, I feel cared for, I feel heard, I feel understood. I feel like someone's actually like giving me their time and attention. I think the best questions, they cause us to, to reflect, to even sometimes reconsider the way we're going. And, and sometimes there's even like a revelation in those questions, right? Like sometimes there's like aha moments for us. We're in a series called Jesus Asked, which is based on the idea that Jesus is really, really, really good at asking questions. I don't know if you know this, but Jesus asked way more questions than he did give answers in the Bible. Something like 300 questions to like, sometimes like three answers. Like that's a different ratio, right? He, he asked a lot of things and that even through him asking these questions, there was often a chance to reconsider. There was a chance to reflect and sometimes even revelation. And, and that's what I hope for this morning as I've been preparing for you guys and as our team has been preparing for this. My, my prayer is that in this, in one of these questions that we're gonna look at in scripture, that you would actually see Jesus more clearly, that you would actually be in all of him more, that you would see maybe him through some fresh lens and perspective this morning. So with that being said, we're gonna jump into John 5, okay? We're gonna be in John 5 the whole time. If you have a Bible, you can be there, um, or it'll be on the screen for you. But I want you to follow along. We're gonna start in verse one. We're gonna see about this interaction that Jesus has with someone and the question that he asks. Verse one, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the sheep gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five colored, covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. Let's pause right there. Because we have to understand why this is important before we go in the story. You'll just be like, okay, what, what, what does this matter? In this story, Jesus is coming to a festival into Jerusalem, a place he's been many times. But the, the place that he enters the city this time is different. It's unique. It's called the Sheep Gate. What is a Sheep Gate? It's a gate for sheep. Okay, that's what it is. Okay, really, really deep, you know, exegesis right there, right? If you're like, wait, is that a fancy name? No, it's actually just a sheep gate, right? So the idea is in Jerusalem, when you came to sacrifice, in Jewish culture, you would bring in animals to sacrifice to, to pay for the atonement of your sins. And this is the gate in which you would bring your sacrifice. Now, there are people in this room who I know are in the livestock business. That would have been a nasty place to walk through, right? Imagine bringing all these goats day by day. There's goats walking here. And it says there's a pool there, right? There's a pool. Now, this is not Bozeman Hot Springs. 
This is not a spa day. And often it seems like it's pictured as that, like, oh, isn't this nice? And, but like, this is a back door where you brought your sheep through and there was a pool there that you had washed them off from the field before you went to sacrifice them. Nasty, right? This is not spa. This is not like many petties, like we're chilling by the pool day. This is not that, right? And it needs to be understood that because that is the scene which Jesus is gonna have an interaction with somebody and who is there? It's a group of people who are labeled as disabled, those who are paralyzed, blind, paral- um, full of maybe even diseased, or there's, there's a multitude of people hanging out in that place where no one else would wanna walk through. No, this is not where you imagine the son of God, the savior to walk through, right? He would come through the VIP entrance or the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Why wouldn't he walk through the front door? Well, no, he actually walks through the back door through a place used for sacrifice. And there's a group of people that most of society would have said they don't have much value. Even the word invalid, if you look at the word, it looks like invalid. That's pretty stark, right? Like these people have no value. And that's, that's not true. And we're gonna see that in the kingdom of God here this morning. So why are they laying there? If you keep reading the story, it says one was there that had been invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked, here's our question. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? You're gonna keep hearing me say that all morning long. Do you want to get well? Let's pause there again. There's a guy, been laying there 38 years. That's a long time. Who's 38 in the room? Okay, a couple people, a couple brave hands. Everybody's like, no, I'm not telling you my age, you know? Um, 38 years, that's a long time. 38 years, laying there. Why is he laying there? If you notice in your text, sometimes verse four is missing. You may have noticed that there's like a little footnote because there's kind of this myth that kind of went about that the reason these group of people were laying there or sitting by this water is there was a belief at the time in culture. Maybe it was folklore, maybe it was a myth, and we don't really know. But at some level, people thought that an angel somehow came and stirred the water and that the first person to get in the water, they would be healed. So there's a group of people who are living there, banking their whole healing and what they're looking for in life. If I could just get in that water, if I see it move a little bit and I get into it, then I can be healed of my disease. Now, we don't know if this really happened or if it was like a a myth. And that's kind of why it's in the subtext. But there's a belief, at least amongst these people, that that this water could heal them at some point. But again, this is murky sheep water, right? This is not your hot tub in your yard. And they're living here and hanging out here and hoping that even in the midst of this muck and dirt and mess, that somehow that could change them. And Jesus walks up to the guy who's been there for 38 years and asks him what on the surface looks like a really dumb question, right? I just told you Jesus asked really good questions. And you're like, that's not a good question. That's obvious. Like, doesn't that seem almost, if you, at the first glance, it might even look like Jesus is mean or, inconsiderate, right? Like, hey, do you want to be healed? Well, duh, Jesus, I've been laying here. I don't have use of my legs. Duh, of course I want healed. See, if Jesus is only speaking to physical healing, then this is actually, seems mean or, or maybe tone deaf or that he doesn't actually get it. But if healing means more than just physical healing, if it's a more holistic healing, then actually what this is, is Jesus is an invitation for this guy, Right? And that's actually what the text means. When you look at what the word means, and that's why in in a lot of translations it says um, that this actually means to be made whole. What Jesus is actually saying is, when he says, do you want to be well? He's saying it's an invitation to be made whole, to be made sound, to be restored. And so Jesus sees the outward appearance. He knows what the need is, what is... what is. understood as a met need for him. Like it's real. Like he, he, like I'm not, I'm not blaming him for what he needs, but Jesus is saying, Hey, there's, do do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be made well? Or do you just want physical healing? There's a greater invitation that it doesn't seem that he fully understands. We'll see this in this next passage. Verse seven is the man's response. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. And that's where that myth comes in, right? So there's that belief. Do you hear that guy's answer? Because Jesus says, do you want to be well? Do you want to get well? He doesn't say yes or no. He doesn't seem like he knows who Jesus is, nor did he even ask Jesus for a miracle, right? He's just laying there looking at the water, locked in, focused on it. And then Jesus comes up to him. He's like, hey, do you want to get well? Well, uh, well, 
well, I don't have anybody to get me in there. And, and someone always beats me to it. And, I, and no one even sees me. And you can almost hear like the apathy in his voice, the, the pity in his voice. However you read that, interpret that, maybe even hear like even some bitterness. Like I'm forgotten, no one cares about me. Well, they jumped in there before me. They got healing, but I'm still here. I'm curious how you read that and how you hear that. Because for him, for this man, this pool represents like the hope that's just right out of reach, right? Like it's right there. I've seen someone else get healed, but I can't get it. And Jesus is saying, do you want to get well? And he's like, yeah, but yeah, I can't get to it. And before we want to mock the man for blaming his condition and his circumstances, I think after 38 years, I would be pretty calloused and bitter too. And if we're being honest, there's some of us in this room and who are watching online that we've been praying for things for a long time and God hasn't answered those yet. And we've kind of gotten bitter too. We're frustrated. It's not our timeline. And we're like, God, why, why don't you do something? Why don't you take this away? Why, why, why does someone else get a prayer answered, but I don't, right? Because I think what this pool represents it's what this man was looking for, for wholeness and for healing. That's what this pool represents. It's, it's an image of what he thinks. If I can just get to that pool, then I'll be made heal. If I can just get my use of my legs back, then everything will be fine. Journey, can I ask you a question? What, what's your pool? What's your pool? Because I got a pool. I got pools that I'm hoping for. I'm putting my hope and trust in thinking that that, like if I just get that one thing, then my life will be fine, right? Like Jesus is at the, like I've fallen Jesus for 20 years and then there's still things in my life where God's saying, hey, Logan, there's some greater work I wanna do. I'm like, yeah, yeah, God, but if you just get this thing, then I'll be good. Then I can pay attention to that, right? It seems like this invitation here is that it's possible that Jesus could be knocking on the doors of our hearts, asking us if we wanna be well and you can actually miss it and don't actually know what God's saying or doing, right? That's what's happening here in this passage. He's still fixated on the pool. And it's not, hear me out. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to have desires and needs and want God to answer them. I'm not saying you should like to ignore those. That's a real need. That's a real need. But what we hear for this man is when Jesus asked him, he can't even say yes or no, but he's, he's caught up in that narrative and that story. He's telling himself, well, well, if this would happen, or if I could just get in the water, or if this person, and like, it's a whole story. Like you hear his identity wrapped up. And the fact that he does like he has an idea, like, God, this is how you're going to heal me. And like, or this is how I'm going to get made well. It's only going to happen in one way. It's the pool. And if we're being honest, I think we all kind of do that, right? Maybe for you, it's like, well, if I can just get this debt out of my way, like if I could just get zero debt, then like that, then I'll be really fulfilled. Or, or I sit with a lot of like college students and they're like, man, if I could just get this job thing figured out. Yeah. Like, I know Jesus is asking me, but like, I just got to get this, nail down this first job out of college and just get that right. And like, it really, I might say I love Jesus and I put my trust in him, but really I got to crush in this interview or my life's going to be in shambles, right? Or if I don't make the team or I, you know, or, or I, I, I've succeeded in life. But like, it's interesting is like these things that we long for and we reach for, it's like the pools of our life that we're sitting there and just saying like, if that would happen, if I could just get there, then I'll be made fulfilled. I'll be complete. I just need that one thing, but it never, it's always out of reach. I can almost hear the guy saying, if I was just strong enough or if I could be better, or if I could do more, maybe, maybe just maybe I'll be all that I'm supposed to be. Is it possible journey that we are limiting Jesus to just one area of healing when there's a greater healing he wants to do in our lives? I'm not saying that, the, that what he needed wasn't real, but Jesus is offering more than what he even is able to understand at this moment. He's like, yeah, great. Like I, like, I want this, but I don't know. He doesn't even know what's available to him who's right in front of him, right? Is it possible that our circumstances, our story, the narrative we've played in our head, the, the, the years of years of what we perceive is just like, just hurt and pain. That it's, it's a barrier for what God might want to heal in our lives. And this is hard. Like as you're hearing this, you might be like, ah, this is, this is difficult. But this is, this is Jesus speaking to this man and he's also speaking to us still now. So what does Jesus do? Does he go, you missed it. I'm out, right? No. If it was me, I would have been like, whatever, bro. I'm going to heal somebody else. You know what I mean? I'd be like, let's heal you. Let's heal you. Let's heal you. No, no, no. Your chance is up. No, forget it. You're done. You know, like, 
Me and my sinfulness, that's what I would have done. I'm like, dude, you don't even get it. You know, and I started healing everybody else because there's a bunch of people. I'd be like, I'm gonna find someone more grateful, right? That's not Jesus. What does he say to the guy who's been there the whole time, doesn't ask for the miracle, doesn't know who he is, doesn't have the right answer? What does he say? Verse eight, Jesus says, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. Guys, he doesn't get it. He doesn't understand it. He misses who Jesus is. His only prerequisite that he has is that he has a need. He doesn't have faith. He doesn't like, oh, I'm gonna trust. Because there's a lot of healing stories in the Bible, right? Some people are like, Jesus, help me. Or like, Lord, have mercy. Like there's all kinds of things. Or like, this guy doesn't do any of that. He's just sitting there, <laughs> just laying there by the pool. And, and Jesus goes, hey, do you wanna be healed? Nah, I, just, I can't get the water. All right, do you still wanna be healed? Well, uh, no one puts me there. Well, hey, get up. Okay, you know, and just gets up. And he's healed. And then something weird happens. He says, take your mat with you. Why would you take your mat with you? Why would you take your mat? Again, context, it's a mat that he's been laying on for 38 years where sheep walk by. That thing's nasty, (laughs) right? I may be reading the text a little bit, but like, can you imagine that mat? You can't move. He's not going to the the porta potty. You know what I mean? Like, like Like he's laying there for a long time on this mat. And Jesus says, hey man, pick that thing up, take it with you. And he rolls it up, takes it with him. Now there's a lot of debate about why he takes this. People wonder if it's for some greater reason. And I, what I do know about Jesus is he doesn't do anything by mistake or by chance, right? There's a reason that he takes him to t- tells him to do that. And, and what he's about to do is be the embodiment of mercy and compassion. Do you know what Bethesda means? It actually means mercy. Do you think that's by chance that Jesus heals a guy who doesn't get it, doesn't understand and shows mercy on a person that doesn't understand mercy beside a pond that's called the pond of mercy or the pool of mercy. It's almost like Jesus knows what he's doing, right? He's like, all right, pick up that mat. Why? We're gonna see. Best part, oh, sorry, let me say this really quick. Our mat can also symbolize our sin and our pain used for Jesus' purpose in our lives. That's what we're about to see. That mat represents his past, his pain, uh, shame, like you're just the guy that lives, lives on the mat. Remember, the only way we know about him in the story is he's the guy, he's the paralytic, he's the invalid, he's the guy laying by the, by the pool. But we're about to see his identity change here a little bit. But that mat symbolizes all those years, all that pain, all that suffering. Journey, what's your mat? I forgot to ask you this question. I almost, you almost got lucky. I almost didn't ask you this question. But I think all of us have a mat too. We all have a pool where we're hoping that it will suffice and give us what we want. And we all have a mat where we just sit in it. And it's like a, a scar. It's, it's the, the weight of this world, the things that we've gotten beat up by this world. And we think, God, what was the purpose of that? Why did that marriage fail? Why did I fail in my business? Why, why is school so hard? Why are things hard with my parents? Why did my parents in a divorce? Like whatever the thing is, and you're like, God, if you're good, then why did that happen? Like, why couldn't you just fix that like this? So we all have that mat that we're, we're like, God, can God really do anything with this? And the answer is yes. We're going to see that in verse nine. Funny part of the story. On the day in which this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat, right? There was 49 rules of things you could and could not carry. Number 49 was a mat, right? <laughs> Seriously, 100, 1,500 and 12 rules about what you could and could not do on the Sabbath. And this guy's breaking number 49 of the carry rules, right? But he replied, the man who made me well said, said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, well, who is this fellow who told you to pick up, the, up and walk? And the man who was healed had no idea who it was for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Awesome part of the story. I don't know how long he's walking. I don't know where he's going, but this dude just seems to be walking around with this smelly mat for a while, right? He's just like walking around with this thing. Don't know what he's saying, but he goes from being the paralytic man to the man walking with his smelly mat, right? His identity's changing a little bit. And there's people going, wait, wait, wait. You can't do that. Put that down. And he's like, well, that guy told me to do it. And he healed me, so I'm gonna do what he says, right? And there, he, you know, there was religion. There's all these things, these rules in place. And he's like, hey man, that didn't help me, but that dude did. Does he know who he is? He doesn't even know his name. So he... <laughs> Journey, it's possible that you could, God could do a work in your life. You don't have your theology figured out. You don't even know why God's doing it. You don't even understand fully, but God and in his mercy, that's who Jesus is. He might just do a mighty miracle and be like, hello, hey, do you want to be made well? That's me. 
We talked about this with the students last week. I said, you know, we're talking about our kids going to Bolivia and Ethiopia and we're preparing for these missions trips. You heard about that. Hopefully you'll come out to our, um, everybody here's welcome to come to our um, fundraiser dinner next Sunday night. But we talked about this idea of like, you know, sharing our faith and sharing the gospel. And it's interesting because the word witness, often it's, it's understood as like something you do. But really a witness is something who you are. Like this guy doesn't even know he's a witness and he's doing it, right? He's just walking around being like, I'm a walking miracle here. He doesn't even know who Jesus is, but he's still walking around with that miracle. And he's a witness of God's power and authority over this, right? That's who God is. That's what he does. He's like, man, I, I can make you a witness and you don't even know. You could be walking around this story, all the scars and the pains and the, the things you've gone through your life. I can use that for my glory. I don't even need you to fully understand it. That's what these videos are about. These amazing guys who share their stories up here. You're hearing them say, this is who I was and this is who God, who God made me to be and this is what he's brought me out of and I'm not going back. They're, they're being witnesses. They're, they're testifying of, of knowing the power and authority of what God's done in their life. And this throws things on its head. We don't fully understand this. We're like, how does that work? And it, it's still a mystery. But that's God and God and his mercy and his compassion for us. That he would love those and heal those who don't even fully get it. If that's you today, there's hope for you today. Jesus' suffering had purpose. Like if, if suffering doesn't have a purpose, then, then what did Jesus go through on Easter? Right, we need, we need it. We, he makes meaning of our suffering, right? And here's what I wanna tell you, friends. God never wastes our suffering. He never wastes our suffering. And we need to understand this because Jesus, his suffering was not in vain, right? It was for you and I that we could have a right relationship with him that through his blood shed on the cross that we can actually come before the Lord and actually have a relationship with him, his suffering had purpose. Friends, all of us who go through things in this life and everybody would have a raised hand like, yeah, me, I got, some, I got some scars, I got some pain, I got some wounds, I got a mat that, man, it, it's messy and gross. I've tried to get my way to God. I've tried to get God to fix my part with my pool. All of us have that. And I, what I'm telling you is God has purpose for it. We don't even fully understand at times. I can't tell you how many things I've walked through in my life where I thought that was the biggest shame and guilt and um, embarrassment. And then as a pastor, which I don't even feel like I should be a pastor half the time. Like, I don't get this. I, I have no part being here, but I get to sit with people and they're like, this is really hard for me to share with you. But, um, and then they share something. I'm like, me too. You know, like I grew up without a dad too. You know, and like what used to be the greatest source of pain and hurt in my life, I get to sit with people and say, you know what? I understand what it's like to have a father wound and I can tell you about the loving father our heavenly father, Jesus, and I want to tell you all about him. And the thing that I thought disqualified me or the hurt or the pain or the things I've done or the cause in my life, like Jesus uses all that. And I don't always know in what time that's going to be, but it's what he does. Friends, I don't know why Jesus chooses redemption over prevention, but it's what he does. He, re he redeems all these broken things. He takes this guy who used to be just the, the invalid, the one who's laying by the pool and moves him to the guy who is carrying his mat and he's being a witness and testimony to people and he's throwing things on top of head. Well, you can't do that. And that's not what God does. And he's like, I'm just telling you, that guy did it. I don't even know his name. And he's not here. Pretty cool. Let's end here on this part of the story. Verse 14. I don't know how much later, but it says, later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you are well again. And here's a plot twist. Get ready. Stop sinning or something worse will happen to you. Dang, Jesus. You know, like, dang, it's harsh. And the man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who made him well. We're going to end our story here, but I want you to hear this. So again, what do we just move from him? He's the guy who's laying by the pool to he's the guy carrying his mat. And now he's the guy in the temple worshiping. Isn't that interesting? And we don't know how much longer and we don't know how long he, it took him to get there. But at some level, Jesus finds him in the temple. And I always wonder what that interaction was. Was he like worshiping like, yeah. God's good. And all of a sudden, God, Jesus is like, psst, psst, like he's beside him in the road. And he's like, he's like, stop sitting. You know, like, oh, you know, like, I don't know what the interaction was, but that's how I imagined my head. Um, but Jesus finds him there and he's like, hey, look, your legs work. You've been made well, physically, you've been made well. Hey, but don't sin because something greater could happen. Something worse could happen than you losing your legs for 38 years. What's worse than losing your legs for four decades? What was it? Separation from God. Eternity in hell sounds a lot worse. Not knowing God, missing Jesus. I could be physically healed and miss out on Jesus. That's worse. That's worse. I could actually get exactly what I want and miss out on the person 
I could get the gifts, but miss the giver of gifts, right? I could, miss, I could want creation, but miss the creator. I could, miss, I could miss the person that can actually save my soul and redeem those broken parts. I was sitting with one of my staff this week, Drew, and, and he said, Logan, isn't it interesting? Like, what if it was God's mercy that he never got what he really wanted? What if he'd actually gotten to the pool first? What if one day through his own scratching and clawing, like he, he beat someone in the pool and he's like, yes, I did it. And I got my healing. He would have never had this moment with Jesus. He would have never been in the temple. We don't, we don't know all the story, but it's interesting that he ends up in the temple. Do you know that you wouldn't have been allowed in the temple if you were clean or unworthy or in that way, like when they saw that ailment, they would have said, you did something wrong with God, so you can't be in here. And yet this guy, somewhere along the lines, he figures out, he doesn't, still doesn't know it's Jesus until after he says this to him, he's in the temple worshiping God. So somewhere along the line, he's like, God's gotta have to be at some part of this story. I don't know what it is, but, I, but I'm gonna go to the temple and I'm gonna go find out about who God is. And who does he run into? Runs into Jesus there. Maybe you walked in here not knowing what you're walking into, trying to figure out if you could just get, maybe get your way to God or maybe I'll do this church thing. And guess what? I hope you encounter Jesus today. I hope that's who you meet here today. Not just some guy with a mullet, you know? Like I hope that you meet Jesus in this space today. I hope that you realize and say, man, is it possible that just that you hear this guy who is saying, do you want to be healed? Do you want to get well? Maybe just possibly that invitation is for you today as well, Right? We don't have to have it all figured out. We don't have to have all our theology in line. We don't even have to fully know who Jesus is. And yet Jesus will show up on the spot and he is still offering you the chance to get made well. So wherever you're at in this faith journey, there's room for you here. And this message is for you. Student, elder, uh, wiser, I might say, you know, uh, empty nester, divorce, wherever you are on the spectrum, you, that you are welcome here and there is healing for you available today. It may just not look exactly what we think it might be, right? But he interestingly he says, don't go back to sinning. Don't sin because something worse could happen. What's sin? Well, sin's going back to the mat. Sin's going back to my old ways. Jesus healed me and done something. And he's like, hey, let this be a turning point for you. Let this be a, a hallmark moment. Let this be a faith defining moment. Don't go back to what you know, but often guys... Or if we're being honest, we go back to the thing. We go back to the mat and we lay back down in that muck and that mire and we just go, you know what? I know this didn't really get me in a good place, but actually I think I can get myself what I want, right? Because Jesus is going, hey, I want to heal. I want to be the Lord of your life. And we're going to talk about that next week, the Lord of our life. But what does it mean when he's like, you're like, no, no, no. Like, I'd just rather you just do the thing for me, right? We talked about this in the fall. It's like the from God life, like vending machine Jesus, right? Like B6, Cheetos come out and I'm happy, right? That's not how God works. He's like, no, 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 no. We want, I want to do a greater work in here. Yes, I'm all for the physical, but let's, I want to redeem all parts of who you are. Are we willing to offer Jesus that room to operate, to move in us? I want to end here, and I just want you to see the beauty of who Jesus is. That, I've told you at the beginning, that's what I hope for, that, that you would just see that, man, God is doing something so much bigger and greater than I can ever see. Because I could tell you this, and you're like, yeah, yeah, whatever, like, what's the proof? Like, what does Jesus do? Like, how, how is it that he can do these things? It's interesting that John writes about these things in John 5, but John, the author of this book, he actually is casting a bigger vision. The whole point is Jesus is awesome. That's like basically the point of John. It's like, Jesus is beautiful and amazing. And just hear this. In verse one, or chapter one of John, he says this. He says, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Isn't it interesting that in the beginning of the book, he talks about that's who Jesus is. He's a lamb, of the, lamb that can take away the sin of the world. Well, where does Jesus walk through? He walks through the sheep gate, doesn't he? So when everybody else is trying to get to God and bringing those sheep and, you know what, I'll, just, I'll make a way to God. Jesus goes, no, 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 no. I'm the way to God. The, these sacrifices you're bringing, I will be the ultimate sacrifice for you. You don't have to do that no more. You don't have to strive anymore. You don't have to try to get this sheep clean and then, you know, go to the healing. No, I'm healing for you. You think that's by chance? No, Jesus knows what he's doing, right? And then John ends his book by this in chapter 20, in verse 30, I think this is beautiful. He says, Jesus performed many other signs, signs of what? Pointing to him in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. In some version, it says there's so many, this book can't contain it, right? So there's other miracles that we don't know about, but why? 
but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So I ask you during church, all of this, all of this points to the fact of all this suffering, all this pain, all this stuff, all of this can be used for his glory and point to the fact that there is a God who can save and redeem even the worst and broken parts of my life. The things I'm afraid of, but, but I, have to, I have to kind of give up the pool a little bit, right? I have to give up the mat. And so I want you to hear the invitation of Jesus at the end of this passage. And this is where we'll land today. I think there's an invitation for us as we, as we leave here today. The invitation is this. Journey, do you want to get well? Do you want to be made well? Are you, are you willing to let God do a healing, a greater work in your life more than just like, Jesus wants my heart, that's all he wants. No, he wants everything, y'all. That's why we say all in followers of Jesus. He wants all parts of us. And he deserves that because he, he, he proved that by going to the cross for us. He didn't just put a little bit of himself into this whole project of redeeming us, right? He went all in. He went all in first before we ever do. And Jesus is offering you that today. Do you want to be made well? It may not look like how you want. It may not be in your timing, but Jesus, this side of heaven and next, he will want, he will redeem all things, right? He says at the end, at the end of scripture, it says there'll be one day when Jesus wipes away every tear. I always imagine it's like this, you know, like that. Because when, when my boys crawl, if you know Forrest, that dude just crashes and burns and falls, right? And he's crying all the time. And I'm really quick to run up there and wipe away his tears. And it says that's where we're heading, that, that one day Jesus will wipe away every tear. But all this pain and suffering that we deal with this world, hey, you know what? There's no more of that. But it's through him. That's the only way we can receive that. Eternity with him. But we also have to hand over our pools because you know what? Our healing is not in those pools. But can I confess something to you, Journey? There's many a time I've sat by pools thinking, being paralyzed by my circumstances and my fear and pity and, and wallowing and thinking that this thing can suffice me and this can heal me and that pool could never help me. Getting what I want would never actually fulfill me. I think it was Thomas Merton that said, what would it take for it to be fully satisfied? He said, everything, right? We think just one more, one more little thing. And it's really Jesus. Jesus is literally sitting by the pool saying, do you want to get well? The invitation for us today, just as much as this man by the pool. And I promise you, he'll redeem and use those broken parts of our story. So journey, we have a choice. We can keep doing what we want to do, laying on our mat, laying by our pool, or we can hear Jesus' call for us today. The choice is yours. The choice is for us every single day. Do you want to get well? Yes. I want to say, I, I want to pray that more days, yes than no. I want to answer that well, but I need his help. And so that's why this song, we're going to talk about making room. Like I need to be able to give God space to do what he wants to do in my life. And I hope that this question ruminates in your brain all week long where you're like, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? I hope that you can't help but hear Jesus and see his beauty in this, that he, he takes the person, doesn't get it, doesn't understand it. And it says even later that, right, he goes to the person, goes to the Jews that will later kill him. So maybe inadvertently, he even hurts Jesus. Like nothing good comes out of this for Jesus, right? And yet that's the person he blesses and shows mercy to. There's room for you and I. Let's pray. Jesus, you are full of compassion and mercy and grace that you just can't help it, but it's you. And so Lord, I pray as we sing this last song that um, more than just thinking about, all right, how does this apply to my life? And how do I live this out tomorrow? Lord, would we just start by being in all of you? Because Lord, there's so many things that I, I go to to suffice me and they don't, they, they never work. A quick fix, but never works. And Jesus, you're standing there in our life and there's that invitation. I just know it that right now you're standing there and you're showing us who you are. And we see your scars, the fact that you went to the cross for us and you, you bled and died for us because you, you, we were all in Jesus for us. And so, Lord, I pray as, as we respond in worship that our hearts would be stirred to worship, that we would sing louder, that we would confess in, that we would um, be moved to repentance, that we'd say, Lord, I'm tired of laying on that mat and laying by this pool. And we would even acknowledge what they are and then just leave them behind and start following you. So, God, would you do that in this space? Would you move our hearts to affection for you? In Jesus' name, amen.